4.4 is concavity and points of inflection. So this is the last little piece of the puzzle that you need to learn in order to be good at curve sketching, which we'll summarize in the next lesson where we do all kinds of different examples of different types of functions that you will go through the complete algorithm to find the graph. So uh, first we need to talk about what does concavity mean. And I'm sure you remember from a lesson you did in grade 10, probably. I'm just going to bring in a little piece of paper here to show you. Um, we talked about parabolas being concave up or concave down. And in my class, if you were in my class, you would have learned that concave up means past the cup. Because you see, it looks like a cup here. You can make a cup out of it. And concave down why the frown. So when a graph goes from being concave up to concave down, you have what we call a point of inflection. And that is seen in a graph such as this. If I do something like this, which would be some sort of cubic function, you can see that at some point along here, probably right about here, and we talked about this as well when we did a derivative, sketching derivative functions, so you can see this is concave down here because I could make a little frowny guy here. And from here, right about here on, it becomes concave up past the cup. And also at this point, that was a point where the slope of the tangents changed from, see it was going down, we're above, the tangent was above, and now all of a sudden the tangent would be under the function. And I'll show that a little more clearly when I do the start of the lesson here. So let's go back to what I've graphed here. Oh no, it came through. Okay, so the first graph here, we have a basic cubic function. And what we're going to do is we're going to sketch right below it the derivative function, the first derivative, and then the second derivative. So I'll just call this y, this graph set will be y prime, and this will be y double prime just so you know, first and second derivatives. So if I were to draw, now remember when you're sketching a derivative function, you're sketching the slopes, the slope values of the tangent lines. So um, when I did that lesson on curve sketching derivatives, I talked about kind of a value for your tangent slope. So if we started down here, if you just look at my ruler here, so this would be a high slope. So let's say that's maybe a, a 3 to a 2 to a slope of 1. And then in here, right where we have this change in direction, we actually have a slope of 0. And then it comes back up again. So 1, 2, 3. So all the slopes were positive, right? We went like 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. Now, you don't have to say exactly what the number is. It's just for you to get an idea of how things are changing. So if I were to draw the derivative of this, it would be like 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. I'm going to be a lot smoother on this side. I don't know what happened to my pencil. And that makes sense to you because you should know that this was a degree 3 and we went to a degree of 2. Now if we go from a degree of 2 and we take another derivative, so let's say we had x squared here. If we took the derivative of that, well let, let's give this actually, we'll call it y equals x cubed to start with. And the sec first derivative would be y prime equals 3x squared. And if I took the second derivative, I get y double prime is equal to 6x, which would be linear, right? So this is really negative. So let's say negative 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it would be, well, if it's 6x, it's going to be very steep. So let's sketch in something that kind of goes like this. Okay, so we went from a cubic function to a quadratic function to a linear function. Now, when we talk about points of inflection, we want to talk about where is there a change in concavity. So you can see that this function was pretty much concave down, 
And if you look again at the tangents, the tangents on this side were all above the curve, right? If I drew tangent lines, they would all be on top of the curve. And then once I went past this point here, which is the point of inflection, the tangent lines are now underneath the curve itself. Okay, do you see that? So this was above and then below. Now this point here became a zero here and this had zero slope here, so it became a zero here. So for this function, um, the second derivative being linear, there's not a lot of shape to it to really make this clear until we talk about something that has more uh, changes in concavity and I think you'll see a pattern. So let's move on to the second one here. So if I were to draw the um, derivative function here, so I don't know what this function is. Let's say this was like minus two and plus two, and this is a zero, and then you'd have to find the a value. So I'm not gonna go about that right now. Um, it's just about all about the shapes, right? So the first thing I want to know is where does this function have zero slope? So that would be here and here. Let me get some color here. So I have zero slope here, and I have zero slope here, and if I, and you know this is going to be a quadratic, right? Because this is a cubic function. So the first derivative is going to be quadratic. So I have zero slope, and I'm going to dot that down, because this is all part of understanding what's happening here. Boom, boom, boom. So I have this point here, that's a zero there. I'm going to have another zero, zero slope. We're talking about slopes, remember? So zero slope here. And if I talk about the, um, the slope of the tangents to this curve, this is pretty high. So let's say this is like five, positive five, right? It's so uphill, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And then on this side, it's um, minus one, minus two, minus three. Ah, what happens here? You see how I'm on above the curve? And all of a sudden, my tangents are going to be underneath the curve and back to zero. So you might want to go back and check the lesson I did on sketching derivative functions, because maybe you've forgotten. But at this point right here, now it doesn't have to be right on the axis here. It could be, could have had it somewhere else, but just the way I've drawn mine. So it was like negative one, negative two, negative three. This was the steepest point here. And then it went minus three, minus two, minus one, zero. So this point here became a minimum point on this function, right? Minus three, minus two, minus one, zero. So minus three, minus two, minus one. So we've got something that's going like this. And then back up to here, back to zero. So we're talking about where the slopes are. So this, these were positive, so I was coming down like this. And on this side, I have zero, and then I went one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's going back up like the other one. Okay, now if I took the second derivative, so here's my zero slope here now, right? Here's my zero slope. So that zero slope has to be a zero on this graph here. These were all negative slopes, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So these are all negative, so I'm below the axis and then I'm going up. So again, I end up with a linear function. And again, that makes sense to you because we started with a cubic, cubic, quadratic, linear. Now what's important here to see is that this point here, which was a point of inflection, on the first derivative became a minimum, but on the second derivative became a zero. Okay, so that's the important point of the second derivative. If you set the second derivative equal to zero, you will be able to solve for this point of inflection. So let's look at a quartic one because that's going to make it even more clear because we have um, a few points of inflection on this curve. And you might want to kind of eyeball that to start with. Can you see where the concavity is changing on this function? So here is all concave up, and then right about mm, here, maybe, 
it became concave down and right about here again it started to become concave up. So do you see the frown in here and the cup on this side? I don't want to draw that, it's going to make a big mess, but I think you can see what I'm talking about. So in order to draw the derivative function, I want to know where are the slopes zero. So here's one zero. Now can you tell me what degree this function is? How many zeros could it possibly have? So if I drew a line right across it here, you'd say, oh, one, two, three, four zeros. So this means this is a quartic function. And I've actually drawn it to be the graph of y equals x to the fourth minus 4x squared, which I'm going to analyze for you completely on the next page. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So I find all my zeros. Where is their zero slope? Okay, not not zeros of this function, but the zero slopes, because that's the derivative. So we can see what y prime here is. It's 4x cubed minus 8x, right? And this was negative slope. So if it's quartic, the next one is cubic, so we should have a cubic function, right? So this is like negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0. So it's coming up. Oh, I guess I could, I'll do it in pencil. Minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0. And then it goes 0, 1, 2, maybe, maybe 3, 2 and a half. Let, what do we hear? Do I hear 2? Do I hear? Mm. So 0, 1, 2, 1, 0. So this point here became the maximum on this curve. So we're going like that. And I have to get back to the zero. So obviously I have to go back down because the slopes, see how we, right here we were under the curve and now this one's going to be above the curve back to zero. And the same thing on the other side here. So now I have negative slope. So I have negative one, negative two, and then negative one to zero. So this point here became a minimum value on the curve. So this one is down here, about the same height, so like that. And then back up on this side, because from here on, these are all positive slopes. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that makes sense, right? We went from a quartic to a cubic function. So now the magic happens because these points here that were maximum and minimum values on my first derivative what are they going to be on the second derivative? So if I follow this down, this is zero slope, right? There are only two places and we're going from a cubic to a quadratic. So let's, let's define the second derivative. So that's 12x squared minus eight, right? So zero slope, so I have to bring this down here. Zero, this is zero slope and that's zero. And on this side we had positive slope to zero and you know it's going to be a quadratic positive slope to zero this is going to be my so in here so watch again so this is minus one minus two we said minus two minus one and zero so this is going to be my lowest point on this curve like that and then back up again over here so again, the most important thing here is that these points here that were my points of inflection, I'm going to write that here, points of inflection, I follow it through, they became the maximum and minimum values on the first derivative, but on the second derivative, and this is what the lesson is all about, on the second derivative, these points became zeros. So this equation here, when set equal to zero, will give the points of inflection. So the points of inflection or the places where the concavity changes. And we're going to call these POIs, POI, the point of inflection. So if you see that in the next lesson, you say, oh, what is he talking about, POI? So they tell you where there is a change in concavity, 
right? The change in concavity from being up to being down, being up. And that is the last thing you're going to stop, talk about in your curve analysis. You're going to state the points of inflection and then you're going to give the, um, the concavity, the intervals of concavity. So you'd say it's concave up from negative infinity to this point. It's concave down from this point to this point. And it's concave up from this point to positive infinity. So keep this graph in mind while we do the um, analysis of this function here, x to the fourth minus 4x squared. So maybe I can keep it in the field of view here a little bit while we start this anyway just for ref reference and then I'll get it out of the way. So when you're doing a complete analysis, the first thing you want to do is to take the first and second derivatives because you will use them, the first derivative, to find the, um, the critical values, so max and mins, the second derivative to find the points of inflection. Um, there's also a second derivative test that I will bring up when we uh, go through this analysis because it has another use other than finding your points of inflection. So just follow along. So I've already done this, so I'm just going to write them out quickly. 4x cubed minus 8x and the second derivative is 12x squared minus 8. Okay, so um, the first thing we want to do is find the x-intercepts. So what are the x-intercepts for this function? So I would say for x-intercept, set y equal to 0. And obviously, I need to factor this function, right? So y equals, I take out a factor of x squared. I'm left with x squared minus 4, which is a difference of squares that I'm going to factor as x plus 2 times x minus 2. So right away, I have my three zeros. So therefore, the x-intercepts are, and I state them, 0, plus and minus 2. So on this graph, this would be my 0 here, and this would be plus 2. I don't have to put a plus 2, but minus 2. Okay, so there's the graph. Now, the next thing you want to do is you're going to find the critical values. So I'm going to write that here. Let's make sure I don't cut off the page. So for critical values, set y prime equal to 0. So I have 0 is equal to 4x cubed minus 8x. I can take out a common factor of 4 and 1x, so 4x. And that leaves me here with x squared minus 2. <clears throat> so that means the critical values are x equals 0 and plus or minus the square root of 2, right? Because you set this to 0. Let me just show you that quickly. x is equal to plus or minus square root 2. Okay, so those are my critical values. Those are not critical points, right? Okay, so let me get this out of the way. So getting back onto this, we can do a first derivative test. So I'm going to do that first. So I'm going to call this y prime. And my critical values are 0, root 2, minus root 2. Okay, so a number bigger than root 2. Let's pick 2. And we're plugging that into the first derivative. Remember where you're, you're at here. So that's this one here. So if I put in 2 here, I'd have 8 times positive 2. That's positive. So I have positive slope. Between 0 and root 2, I plug in a 1. I'd have 4 times 1 minus 2. That's negative. So that's going to be negative in here. On the other side here, you can probably see it's going to be the same thing because I have, if I plug in negative, negative 1, this would be negative 4, and I put a negative 1 here or here. Um, that would be plus, so it's going to be positive here. And on the other side, if I put in negative 2, negative 2 would give me negative 8 here, and times 2 would be a negative number. All you're worried about is the sign. So that implies that there is um, 
a minimum value here. Minimum, this is another minimum, and a maximum at zero. And if we just take a quick look at the graph that we had, that's true. You can see the minimums. These are going to be um, root two here. It's going to be negative root two. It's not to scale, but it gives you the idea. So um, a minimum, a minimum, and a maximum. Okay, get this out of the way again. Okay, so now the, there's a second derivative test. And this one you're going to love because I'm going to write it right here. Second derivative test. Okay, so what does that mean? A second derivative test says that if you take the second derivative, so here's my second derivative, y double prime equals 12x squared minus 8, and I evaluate that at the critical values. So I know these are critical values here, and I want to know if the second derivative is positive, then I have a minimum. If the second derivative is negative, I have a maximum. Okay, let me show you how that would work with this equation. So I'm going to do y double prime when, that's what this means, when x is equal to zero. And all I want to know, is it going to be positive or negative? Well, you can evaluate it if you want, but if I put in a zero here, I would get negative eight. So y double prime is less than zero when x equals zero, sorry. When x equals zero, y double prime is less than zero. And I'm gonna show you a really funny, cute little way to remember this. So if it's less than zero, it's negative, right? So I put two negatives there. Don't say that's a positive, it's just for a little picture here. Two negatives, and this guy is very sad. So he's sad. And this, if you look at his mouth, it has a maximum maximum at x equals zero. Now, if we do y double prime when x is equal to, well, it doesn't matter if I can put plus or minus root two here when I evaluate this one because I'm squaring it, right? You square, it's gonna be the same number if it's negative or positive root two. So root two squared is just two. Two times 12 is 24 minus eight is 16. So all I need to know is that this is greater than zero. And watch, if I is greater than zero, then it's positive, and this guy is happy, and this has a minimum. The minimum is here on his mouth, okay? I had one student one time say, oh, doesn't this mean that you're dead? <laughs> I said, no, it's not positive, they were X's, right? The, the, uh, the sign for a dead man was this, right? And that would probably make you very sad. But we're not dealing with those. We're dealing with plus and minuses. I'm going to erase that because I don't even want you to think about it. Okay, so like men in black, erase that from your memory. So here, look, two negatives. It's negative, so negative there for a maximum. Um, I had a student write all these on their exam, and I said, that's not really what you're supposed to do. It's a little tool to help you. Okay, so therefore minimum at plus and minus root two. Now, you know that if you say plus or minus root two, I'm only talking about the x coordinate. And if you're going to sketch this, you need to know what the y value is. What is the point? P-O-I-N-T, right? So the second derivative test, as you can see, this, this second derivative is good for finding points of inflection, which we're going to do next. But also the second derivative test allows you to use the second derivative to determine whether or not you have a max or a min. And that's that's important, okay? It's also a little faster than the first derivative test, especially if your second derivative is something very simple like we have in this example. Okay, so uh, maximum at zero, so I need to go back to my original function here to find the y-coordinate. So maximum point is zero and zero. I plug in a zero, everything's zero. And minimum points 
will be negative root 2 and so I put in negative root 2. Oh, negative root 2. If I square negative root 2 or to the fourth power. So if I squared it, I'd have 2. And I square it again, that gives me 4. And I square this root 2, that gives me 2. Minus 4 is um, minus 4. Right? So I have minus root 2 and minus 4. And root 2 and uh, root 2, root 2. It's going to give me the same thing, isn't it? Right, root 2 squared is going to be, this is confusing me, root 2 times root 2 is 2 t squared is 4 minus, 4 minus um, 8. That's what I should have said the last time, because this is minus 4, not 0. Okay, so root 2, negative root 2 and negative 4. Sometimes it's hard to see all these things on, on a video. And root 2 and minus 4. You do the math. I'm right. Okay, so that tells me where the um, max and minimum points are. And the next thing you're going to do, because now you're doing a complete sketch, is find the points of inflection. So let's write that over here. So for points of inflection set y double prime equal to zero. Okay, so that's what I showed you in the first part there, how if you bring them down, right? Let me bring that back in here just to remind you. So here's my point of inflection, became a max, but on the second derivative was the zero. So I'm setting the second derivative equal to zero to find these points of inflection. So that means 12x squared minus 8 is equal to 0. 12x squared is equal to 8. I divide by 12. x squared equals 8 over 12 is the same as 2 over 3. So x is equal to plus or minus the square root of 2 thirds. Okay, now don't, don't be upset when you get weird numbers like that because, I mean, that happens, right? Okay, so now I want to check to see if these are points of inflection because it's quite possible if you started with a function like x to the fourth, which you know doesn't have any points of inflection, right? The graph of x to the fourth, let me just make you a little scoot. It looks like this, right? It's kind of like a flat bottomed parabola. So if I, there's no points of inflection, this graph is concave up everywhere. Now, that would mean that even though you set it equal to zero, it's going to still give you zero, but you don't have points of inflection. Okay, just make sure, because you're going to have to check to see if there is a change in concavity. Is there a change in concavity? Just like with first derivative, was there a change in the sign of the slope? Did it go from positive to negative or negative to positive? So I'm going to make a little number line here again. I'm going to label it y double prime. And I'm going to put on those points of inflection that I said I had. So minus root 2 over 3 and plus root 2 over 3. And I'm going to check into the second derivative. That's just this one here. It's a nice simple equation. I'm going to see if the ch sign changes. So if it's positive, it's concave up. If it's negative, it's concave down, right? So we go here and we go to the left. So let's say, let's say minus, minus one. So if I put in minus one here, I would have 12 minus eight is four. That's positive. And that means it's concave up. If I go between minus root two over three and root two over three, I put in a zero, I would get negative eight. That means it's concave down. And over on the other side here, if I plugged in a 1, I would have the same as on the other side, a positive, and it is concave up. Okay, so I went from concave down, concave up to down to up at these points, and I've proven that there is a change in concavity. So I'm going to say, therefore, points of inflection are... And then I have to go back and find, so I have minus root 2 over 3, 
and I need to find the y value. Remember, anytime you're finding a point, you have to find the, um, the y coordinate from the original function. So I'm going to put that back into this equation here. And I'm going to, let me just do that for you. I'll do one. Well, if I do one, they're going to be the same, right? They're going to be the same values because I'm raising to the fourth or squared. So I have root 2 over 3 to the fourth power minus 4 times root 2 over 3. And that's squared. So root 2 over 3 to the fourth power. So if I squared it, I would have 2 over 3. If I square 2 over 3, I have 4 over 9. And minus 4 times root 2 over 3 squared is just 2 over 3. Let me just throw away those radicals because they're to the half power. Um, or another way you could do that if you're having trouble with this math. Root 2 over 3. Where can I write that? So if I did this, right? Root. No, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to say root 2 over 3. Oh, I'm right off the page. I'm sorry. So I had root 2 over 3 is 2 thirds to the half power. Right? Half power. And if I do 2 over 3 to the half power to the fourth power, which was what I had here, that would make this squared. So 2 thirds squared is 4 ninths. Okay, all that to just help you a little bit maybe with some of your math skills. So I have 4 over 9 minus 4 over 3. So that's 4 over 9 minus, sorry, 8 over 3. And I want to put that over 9, so that's 24 over 9. And that gives me minus 20 over 9. So that's going to be the y. Oh, I'm so bad at shifting these up. So this is going to be the y value for both of these because the degrees are 4 to the 4th power and squared. Okay, don't jump to conclusions and think they're both going to be the same every time because they're not. So minus 20 over 9 and minus 20 over 9. Okay, so you're not finished yet because in a complete analysis, you must give the intervals of increase and decrease as well as the intervals of concavity now. And that's the last thing you have to do. So it's not, it's not too onerous, is it? So intervals of increase and decrease. That's my first job. So to find those, you look back to your first derivative, right? Because remember I told you, here's decreasing, here's decreasing, because they're going down. So that's negative infinity to negative root 2. So I'm going to just write um, decreasing. You can write it out in better words. Now, they're all round brackets, right? Not square. Square includes a point. In this point, we're not. We don't include those points because those are max and mins where there is zero slope. So it's increasing or decreasing from negative infinity to negative root 2 u for union as also including so decreasing from here to here can you see that so we have decreasing here and we have decreasing here so decreasing from zero to root two so zero root two increasing interval so i go back to my little sketch here increasing from negative root two to zero okay i know you can't see this but i'll, I'll move it up in a second negative root 2 to 0, and then increasing from root 2 to infinity. So root 2 to infinity. Okay, so there's my increasing and decreasing intervals. In decreasing and increasing. So now I also have to say the intervals of concavity. That means where is it concave up, where is it concave down. So I'm going to say C, C up, concave up. Okay, look here. You've already done the work. It's concave up from negative infinity to negative root 2 over 3. And here, so right here and here. So concave up, round bracket. Um, so negative infinity to negative root 2 over 3. And from root 2 over 3 to 
infinity, concave up. And CC down, concave down. Now that's kind of messy. Let me make it prettier for you. I'm sure you really care, right? Concave down. You have to be able to read it at least. So concave down, it's right here. So you've done all the work with your, your little number line drawings here. So I have negative root 2 over 3 and 2 root 2 over 3. Ta-da! Now you've done a complete analysis. And then, of course, you'd have to sketch it, which we've already done here. So, and you would label things, you know, like you'd label all these um, root 2 over 3 and whatever the value was, minus 20 over 9. So you make a really nice sketch and it would be completely accurate. It's not a sketch anymore. It's a complete analysis of a graph. And there you go. So I'll probably do another example. Um, I think the last section, 4.5, is just complete analysis of all sorts of different functions. And I'll try to find a few that are uh, trickier, ones that my students definitely had more trouble with. And I hope that serves you well in your sketching. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. Subscriptions bring other people to the site. And that would be awesome. Tell all your friends. And get if every one of you who have subscribed got one more person to subscribe, another friend, then the, the um, channel would keep growing. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.